This PowerPoint goes along with notes 52B and 53B, and this is part two of evolution and Darwin's theory of natural selection. So it's basically going over the history of how he developed this theory. <clears throat> now, in the important concepts from the previous units, you will see the definition of population. So it's important that we cover that here to try to clear up some misconceptions later on. Populations are defined as groups of the same species that live in the same place at the same time and are able to reproduce. Okay, so here's Charles Darwin, and he is the one that developed the theory of natural selection. He was born in 1809 in Shrewsbury, England. Um, he attended, uh, began attending the university at 16 to become a, a doctor like his father and grandfather had. But he was not really interested in medicine. He was a naturalist. He loved nature books. He loved to hunt, uh, fish, collect insects. And so he left there to go to Cambridge, which was a religious institution. And he studied to become a priest um, and also a naturalist. And most naturalists at that time were priests. Okay, so he graduated from Cambridge in 1831. And his botany professor at Cambridge recommended that instead of entering the seminary, that he go and join Captain Robert Fitzroy on the HMS Beagle and work there as a doctor and a naturalist on the ship. Now, they often time, times would have naturalists on the ships in case they came across new organisms that had not been discovered, and that way that those people were trained to be able to document and make records of all of that. So um, they all had naturalists on board. So they were planning a very long voyage around the world with the primary purpose of being able to chart poorly known sketches of, or stretches, I should say, of the South American coastline. So this journey took them five years, and he returned in 1836. Now, while he's there, he collects plants, animals, fossils on every stop of the journey and sends them back to England. Uh, he took two books with him. Uh, you have seen both of these books. We've mentioned both of these books in the previous uh, PowerPoint. Um, so by two individuals that he used their opinions um, and studies to help support his and develop his theory of natural selection. So one of the areas that they stopped at was the Galapagos Islands, which you have probably heard in regards to natural selection. It was a group of volcanic islands that were about 900 kilometers west of South America. So in 1859, he publishes his book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And in, interestingly enough, instead of the word evolution, which is only used one time in the entire book, and it actually happens to be the last word in the book, uh, he calls it descent of modification instead. And what that descent with modification means, descent just means that it takes a long period of time and that that's required to bring up modifications within a species to be able to better survive and reproduce within a certain environment. Uh, so due to them facing certain environmental conditions. Um, so these ideas actually were not his initially, um, or that he was not the first one to publish them, let me say it that way. Uh, these ideas were published first by a gentleman named Alfred Russell Wallace in 1858. But he conceded and allowed Darwin to be known as the architect of this because uh, Darwin had done and completed more research than he had. So what natural selection said was um, that it was a process in which individuals with certain inherited traits tend to survive and reproduce at higher rates than other individuals because of them having those traits. So there's different levels of success in reproduction and survival based on their ability to survive in that particular environment. So nature is kind of filtering out what would be considered the weak traits in that particular environment. So a strong trait would be something that's beneficial for them surviving and reproducing. Weak traits would be something that's not helpful to them. So like in this environment, uh, you have these dark beetles here that don't blend in quite as well with the leaves. And so 
this is would be their color coloration would be considered a weak trait because they would be more likely to be consumed by predators than those that were green. Okay, so um, the environmental stresses affect the success rate of the individuals in a population um, in different ways, and it's the populations that evolve, not the individuals. This beetle right here is never going to decide, hey, I might need to be a darker color um, so, you know, so that I have more, I am more likely to be eaten, okay? He's in a good place. However, this guy is not going to be able to decide on his own, hey, I am a dark color and that puts me at greater risk for being eaten, so I think I'll turn green. That is not what happens. Basically... What happens is this guy winds up being eaten because he sticks out more than the one that is green. And so in the next generation, the uh, green beetles are surviving. They are going to pass their traits on to the next generation. And so they are more likely to be green. Even if they possibly have a recessive trait for the darker color, it would take two of those heterozygous individuals to have a 25% chance of having that darker trait. So... Um, over time, over generations, there would be more green beetles just because the environment kind of created that and selected that. So it's populations that are changed. It is not individuals themselves that are changed. So he said that life is a struggle for existence and nature ultimately decides who gets to survive and reproduce and he, who doesn't because of the environment uh, forces or pressures killing them off. Now, there are also things called artificial selection, and we do that in foods, and that's where man selects the traits that are desirable or beneficial in a species. So the humans select which traits we want, and we breed the organisms possessing those desired traits. So, uh, for example, in plants, which ones make the best or the most fruit, or they have the most appealing color in the backyard, or uh, are most productive in the garden, or domesticated animals, which ones are the most valuable in terms of food or some other characteristics. So men, humans, can also potentially erase what um, is naturally created by controlling which organisms get to reproduce and which don't, which traits get to be passed on and which don't. And that's not always the best thing for uh Success. Um, there's some. There are some examples of artificial selection backfiring on us. We've made insecticides that have created insecticide resistant bugs. The ones that were susceptible to the insecticide, of course, were killed, and the ones that were left were resistant to the insecticide. So they survived, kept passing on that resistance to the generations below them, and you get a bunch of superbugs that are not resistant to the insecticides. Um, HIV and AIDS virus uh, has become resistant to medicinal treatments that we have now. We've talked about MRSA in biology and in anatomy, um, that it's an antibiotic resistant strain of staph because we have overused antibiotics so much that now we have all of these mutated forms of bacteria that are no longer resistant. Those uh, bacteria that were resistant to the antibiotics continued to reproduce while the others that were not resistant um, were killed by the, the antibiotics. Now, Darwin cited several different types of evidence for what he called common ancestry. So that means that there were common ancestors and that gradually these adaptations continued in the survival of the fittest and then in different environments those branched off into a variety of different organisms. Um, and he studied something that was called homology. All right, now we know from your prefixes homo means same. Ology is study of. So he studied things that were the same, okay, to give, again, it was the study of what he would say was common, things that pointed to common ancestry. So one of those things were homologous structures, um, and these were skeletal structures, limb structures, specializations that he talked about in his book, and he used this as one example, that the four limbs of all mammals show the same arrangement of bones from the shoulder down to the digits or their fingers, 
despite having different functions. So they behave in different ways, but they have the same arrangement of bones. He also used uh, something called...